interesting compilation uh, from uh, Kersey. This is a collective uh, project, Piston Pen and Press, and Kirsty and the team uh, that involves the University of Strathclyde, University of Manchester, and the Railway Museum uh, will all be giving a little talk here. So um, we'll play that video uh, now. Hello. This is a short talk about Mechanics Institute's literary culture and the Victorian industrial worker. I'm Kirsty Blair from the University of Strathclyde. And this talk comes from an AHRC funded project that I've been working on um, with the rest of the team also on this panel called Piston, Pen and Press. And what we're doing here is we're exploring the ways in which industrial workers, specifically thinking about miners, railway workers and textile factory workers, engaged with literary culture as readers, as writers and as members of associations and societies. So mechanics institutes are playing quite a large part in this because we're thinking about how industrial workers used those institutes to gain entrance into forms of literary culture. Mechanics institutes, as you'll all know, often hosted reading rooms and libraries, and these were quite extensively used by the industrial workers we examine. They ran evening classes, they hosted lectures, a number of them on what we might call literary topics like Shakespeare or Burns or local poets. Um, they ran debating societies and other associated literary societies, and they were used as meeting places and social spaces. For instance, if you were a mill worker in an amateur dramatic club, it's possible that you were using the Mechanics Institute as a space to rehearse and practice. So this brief talk is going to give a couple of examples of writers we have identified who were linked to a local Mechanics Institute. Saddleworth Mechanics and Literary Institute um, Saddleworth is near Oldham in Manchester and was a mill town, is associated with two little known writers in our database, both of whom wrote in dialect. Edwin Thornton was a woolen dyer. Um, he's an example of someone who we know wrote essays, hymns and poems, but actually very few of them have been identified. Later than him, a couple of decades after his association with the Institute, David Lawton is a better known dialect writer because he published in these um, quite well known newspapers and forums for uh, factory workers. And he was very strongly associated with the Cooperative Society as well as with Mechanics Institute, which educated him and thus enabled him to have this um, poetic and editorial um, aspect of his career. Over in Northumberland, we've identified a large group of Collier poets, and they were all linked to the various institutes, many established by the Collieries, um, near their specific workplace or in their local village. Um, so two tiny examples, Mark Doney of Cramlington actually helped to found the Shankhouse and Hartford Mechanics Institute um, and to run it for a number of years, and Charles Hopper, got his education again um, at the Seton Delaval Mechanics Institute through attending their classes um, and was linked to the new university extension movement in the second half of the 19th century. You can see uh, a Charles Hopper poem in the Blythe News on the right. They called this crowd the Blythe News Poets because they all published and were associated with this newspaper. Um, but so many of them had this additional link where their poetry um, is kind of mediated by their association with mechanics institutes. And finally, um, an individual example, John Thomas Graham, secretary of Steeton Mechanics Institute. Um, this is just outside Bradford. He was a spinner, factory spinner at the age of 11. Um, again, his education, his reading education was from the reading room in this institute. Um, and in his unpublished manuscript memoirs, um, he notes that he read the London Daily Papers at the Village Institute and that this is how he became interested in politics and started developing as a socialist. And he used this education to advance his career because he moved from being a child factory worker into actually a, um, effectively a higher grade pro profession as a clerk outside manual labour. So these are a few intriguing examples of the many, many ways in which mechanics institutes influence the cultural and the literary life of local villages and towns 
and enable industrial workers to get involved in those forms of culture. Perhaps the most fascinating thing about Mechanics Institutes for me is the sheer variety of speakers and events they played host to. Morris Vaughan, engine driver turned social commentator and educator, believed that workers were best placed to learn amongst their machines. If they couldn't find a site for self-education within the work environs, he argued, they should at least bring the machinery to them. They needed a space where they could study models, swap ideas and solve problems together. For some, this was to help with specific tests or exams, but for many others, writers like Vaughan felt, it was under that wonderful 19th century catch-all of self-improvement. The Mechanics Institute in York, for example, was one of the bigger ones, able to maintain correspondence with the Science Museum in London and borrow from its loaning supply of demonstration equipment and lecturers. No matter the size, however, Mechanics Institute seemed to have mirrored the eclectic and hugely varied space that was working class education and leisure at the time and the way those two things intermingle. Workers at Shildon's Railway Institute, a mechanics institute whose narrower name is just indicative of the single industry nature of that northeastern railway town, saw between 1859 and 1873 lecturers speak on the topics of manliness, Borneo, phrenology, the abolition of capital punishment, Shakespeare, Lincoln, Captain Cook, Hogarth, the poet Oliver Goldsmith, and the medical benefits of Turkish baths. This was in addition to a regular programme of industrial lectures, more specifically about the railways and the steam engines that they worked with. Organisers and audience seem to have seen nothing wrong with this eclectic mix, nor indeed was it inappropriate, clearly, for the lecture series to break and hold a one-off benefit concert for the local Saxon band in 1861. All of these and more fell under the remit of the Mechanics Institute. The other point worth reflecting upon, I think, is that Mechanics Institute seem to have rarely been one-way streets for a receptive working class audience and didactic middle class speakers. Firstly, neither audiences nor speakers were so clearly divided along class lines. Secondly, and more importantly, Mechanics Institutes were a place where working class needs and causes and ideas came into the wider public sphere. So when, in 1901, the Bradford Women's Liberal Association had to borrow the local Mechanics Institute as an overflow venue for their meeting, a performance by the Bethesda Welsh Choir, made up of quarrymen from an ongoing strike in Penryn, helped highlight the particularly vicious nature of that industrial dispute for a wider audience. Even their detractors were forced to admit their utility as spaces where the working class could find a sort of purchase and an identity. One reverend at a Durham temperance branch meeting in 1904, whilst arguing that church lads brigades and friendly societies were better venues for teaching moral virtues from the church to the audience, had to admit that reading rooms have developed into quite large and attractive clubs for workers themselves. Hello, I'd like to talk to you briefly about the Ashton Underline Mechanics Institute between 1825 and 1856. Now we're fortunate that we have a good surviving set of records for this institution, which enables us to chart its development over a long period of time. Uh, and what I propose to do in this short talk is to offer you four snapshots of the Mechanics Institute between 1825 and 1856. So my first snapshot are the management committee minutes of 1825 and 1826 close to the formation of the institution which record the appointment of a paid librarian on a salary of 10 pounds per annum and a schoolmaster on an annual salary of 20 pounds and a library consisting largely of scientific and technical volumes. So we're looking, I think, at a classic mechanics institute based on that middle class radical useful knowledge approach. My second snapshot is a public meeting held in Ashton on November the 10th, 1836, organised by the Mechanics Institute, which passes a resolution which notes, amongst other things, quote, the great and increasing desire among the working classes for knowledge and self-improvement end quote, observes that the working classes, quote, ought mainly to depend upon themselves and their own exertions for improvement, end quote, but also notes that they had a claim uh, on the support of the higher classes, 
as they pursued uh, education and uh, self-improvement and that the Mechanics Institute uh, was the uh, formal recognition of that claim. So I think what we see here is the Mechanics Institute moving away from a top-down approach uh, towards a model which combines uh, some uh, from below elements as well as some top-down elements. My third snapshot are the annual reports from 1843 and 1844, right in the middle of the Chartist period, the Chartist challenge. And here we see repeated anxieties um, over the failure of the Mechanics Institute to actually recruit working class members in, in significant numbers. The 1843 annual report uh, records that out of 124 members, only 13, i.e. just over 10%, mm -hmm. are actually factory operatives. Uh, likewise, the 1844 annual report is somewhat mystified as to why its own classes are so poorly attended when the evening classes offered by the Sunday schools are packed to the gills. My final snapshot is the annual report from 1856, so a post-Chartist uh, report. And uh, the report notes a general increase in membership and uh, also an increase in the percentage of factory operatives who are members of the Mechanics Institute. So the general membership in 1856 has risen to 350. That's almost treble the membership in 1843, of which 82 members are factory operatives. Now that's more than a sixfold increase on 1843, suggesting that the kind of class accommodation or class reconciliation which the Mechanics Institution had been uh, desiring for over two decades is now, uh, at least it seems, beginning to take place, beginning to take shape in Ashton Underline. Thank you for listening. In the UK, the opening of Mechanics Institutes were often celebrated with an opening lecture or soiree. These occasions regularly featured poetry in the speeches given at the events. Sometimes these poems were already well known to the listeners, but these could also include original verses written by a working class institute member. Speakers were using poetry to highlight their literary achievements and demonstrate their engagement with established authors and literary canons. Importantly, they were also setting out their own literary aspirations through their membership in the Institute as a means of affecting their personal improvement. My first example also comes from the Saddleworth Mechanics Institute. In the mid-19th century, Institute members were mostly young men in their late teens. At a soiree held in July 1850, James Platt, age 19 and a woolen cloth dresser in a local mill, read his essay, Poetry and the Laws of Versification. According to the newspaper report, he also gave, quote, many illustrations from memory of different sorts of verse, which included two original poems of his own. One of these was reprinted, and its subject was the joys to be had in the ending of one's bachelor's status. Following his poems, the group heard from Ralph Rhodes. Rhodes was 16 and worked as a cotton piecer. He, quote, read a piece of poetry from a little book, which he truly designated simple, about the death and burial of a robin redbreast. This refers to a popular English nursery rhyme. My next example comes from the Milnesbridge Mechanics Institute, West Yorkshire. Milnesbridge also had a number of woolen mills, and many of the mill workers belonged to the Institute. In 1855, its third annual soiree was held. The local newspaper reported that the purpose of the Institute was, quote, the intellectual and moral improvement of the entire neighborhood. On the evening of February 19, 1855, there were about 400 attendees, mostly composed of young people. After a few speeches and several musical pieces, the audience heard four poems recited by Institute members. These included three poems written by Martin Farquhar Tupper, who was a contemporary moralistic writer of poetry and prose, along with poems by popular writers Mrs. Hemans and Sir Walter Scott. From possible matches in the census records, we know that the Mechanics Institute members who recited these poems included, first, Christopher Eastwood, who was possibly 15 years old and whose family all worked in the mills. Second, Ben Haig, also 15, who worked as a woolen weaver. 
Joshua Beaumont, another 15-year-old who worked as a woolen spinner, and finally, Henry Whitley, again, age 15, who was a piecer at a cloth mill, who later became a national schoolmaster. As is evident from the newspaper reports of these social events, these young members of their local mechanics institutes were reciting and writing poetry to demonstrate their past education, to assert their present status as members of an important cultural institute, and to convey their shared hopes for a brighter future through the institute's resources. Great. Well, thank you very much for that team. Uh, I think we can bring them all on so we can see them because uh, they're all uh, in the talk. Um, clearly, uh, Helen has got some connections with the Thames side, which is the Ashton link. So there's links there. Um, and, you know, amazing to have 15 year olds, you know, attending the Mechanics Institute. You know, I think, uh, you know, there's a, it, it's, it's great to, to have those individuals uh, picked out and remember just the same way that that Liz was talking about the people in the archive uh, from Rochester. So it is nice to put some um, uh, uh, names and, and 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 to some of the some of the activities going on. And uh, clearly, as a poet, I love the idea of the live news poets. Um, so, uh, are there any questions coming up? Uh, John has commented that uh, terrific papers um, and clearly. In this, you've just given us a snapshot of the work that's going on in this group, and uh, uh, I can ask, when, when does the project finish, uh, and what would be the deliverables? Because that's what people want to know in universities these days. What are the deliverables? Well, uh, Patrick, that depends on um, the length of the COVID-19 related extension that we end up with, but we hope that our database will be finished by um, next year. So I should highlight that one of the things that you'll be able to do is go in and search for the words mechanics or institute and get every reference in that database relating to an industrial worker um, who we found to use an institute and also had some kind of um, literary connection or activity. Um, and also that anybody who's got information about such industrial workers in Scotland and the North of England, um, who may have written poetry or been involved in a literary capacity in an institute, we'd love to hear from you because they can go into our database as well. I am um, well aware from on this Mechanics Institute, the first thing you ever have to figure out with this Mechanics Institute business is how to spell mechanics. <laughs> and and, and Mike, Mike, Mike McLaughlin said, you know, he got this uh, brass plaque uh, from, from Tasmania, which had it spelt wrong, you know, because it was like one Mechanics Institute rather than lots of Mechanics Institutes. So, so this database, is it going to be sophisticated enough to know that the spelling mistakes are likely so you could have mechanic institute mechanics institutes with a you know with apostrophe or mechanics apostrophe s we hope so we hope so we have some very good digital humanities people who are not us working yeah. on how to do this and also how to search all the variations in yorkshire lancashire and scots dialect which is a particular issue for us in this of respect course. yes the uh, tanya i think is asking to repeat where do you access the database so i think you would uh, you can put your web page uh, yeah. in the chat and then uh, they can get in touch with you but i don't think it's accessible at the moment it is not but if you check our website you can find the things we're up to at the minute um and if you follow us on twitter that's where there are announcements about our various activities piston and press so that's mechanic the piston pen and press so that does link the mechanics to the it's a very apt title that so uh lauren and, and michael thank you for your contributions uh, are there any points you would like to just raise? If I may, I just to say one thing that I, that is emerging for me out of the first paper we heard this morning, and also out of John's paper, and it's something that Ollie um, alluded to as well, is ways finding ways of thinking about mechanics institutions as kind of way streets to use Ollie's phrase that that relationship between both the, the middle classes and the working classes, but also the ways in which external radical organizations, uh, particularly in my case, Chartism, uh, actually fed through and affected the shape uh, and types of activity that mechanics institutions undertook. And, I, and if anybody's got any ideas about how we might go about exploring that, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear from people. And that phrase was raised streets. 
a two-way street. Two-way street, sorry, two-way yeah, street. Yeah, because yeah. one of the things yeah. that we're hearing is that initial model, which sees, as it were, essentially middle-class professionals Down delivering with, instruction, yeah. clearly by the 1840s, 1850s, has changed into something that's a little bit different, retains elements of that, but clearly is, is moving to a more dialogic um, formulation. And I, I'd just be interested, you know, from, from the kind of people's experience of their own local institutions, whether they can trace similar kinds of pressures and also how those pressures manifest themselves. Oh, nice. I, um, you mentioned phrenology. Somebody else mentioned phrenology. Of course, uh, that's a study we don't do these days, but um, the phrenology building sat next to the original uh, Watt institution when it moved into Chambers Street, and it was a donation from the Herriot that gave it the phrenology museum next door, which was then incorporated in, and that's when it became Herriot Watt College. So, so people often ask, where does Herriot and Watt come together? Because historically, they didn't actually meet each other being in different centuries. So uh, phrenology, um, uh, there's a comment from John about uh, many members fought to get access to authors such as Scott. Uh, and where do you see the poetic influences coming from? And where were the dominant metrical forms? I think that's a long question. Uh, in the chat, uh, uh, but but the poetic influences um, that would be I think that's worthy of another another discussion somewhere, uh, maybe outside this forum. 